Well, I'd like to thank you so much. As they say in the United States, sometimes I wish my mother was here uh, to hear that introduction. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Wendy Brown and uh, Charles Pilgrim for facilitating uh, my visit with you. And um, it's a real pleasure. I thought I might warm the crowd up by just uh, giving you some funny things Donald Trump says. But then I, I was paralyzed because everything he says is pretty comical. Uh, so uh, just one disclosure here. The objectives of our time tonight, and I don't often give lectures to the lay public, so I've, I've spent a great deal of time with this, and some of my medical colleagues may say this is um, not gonna, any uh, really innovative cutting uh, molecular biology, but I want to communicate to the public tonight. And I, I did throw a few slides in here for uh, some of the specialists in the room, and I've enjoyed the afternoon of really uh, hearing about some of the cutting edge research that's being done here in Melbourne. And I've enjoyed my visit just seeing all the amazing things that are being done uh, in Adelaide and Brisbane and, and here. But I really want to point to some of the impacts that esophageal, pancreas, and liver cancer are making in our community. Recognize some of the increased incidence we see and the challenges and the risk factors that we can identify because risk factors are things we can change, uh, perhaps. Some of them we can't, but some of them we can. And discuss some of the strategies to impact these diseases and then to really stimulate some thought in the general public uh, as well as hopefully some thought uh, with uh, medical colleagues in the room as well. You know, cancer in the United States has really been the, the number two uh, killer behind cardiovascular disease for a long time. But this last year, it bypassed cardiovascular disease as the number one killer in our country. And when we think about the five most dangerous cancers in men, I think it's pretty easy to say prostate cancer or lung cancer and colon cancer. But you see on the far right there, pancreas and liver cancer additively are, are much greater than even prostate cancer. And so these are important things to think about. And I also want to address esophageal cancer because it occurs more commonly in men also. When we think about some of the, the genetic or inherited disorders we recognize in cancer, that's only really about 10% of the disorders. And so about 90% of the cancers that we see are not inherited syndromes that we worry about our offsprings having or our parents uh, passing on to us. And when we think about really what increases our risk of developing cancer, we think about things like tobacco use. I mean, I've been so impressed in Australia. In the United States, we still make tobacco packaging very attractive. And Australia has certainly led the way in at least acknowledging how damaging it is to our health. But also nutrition and alcohol use, and not to condemn anyone that had a drink at the, at the break. This is excessive alcohol use. And the rising incidence of obesity, Dr. Brown and her colleagues have really tried to address obesity and think about it in a very physiological way and in a surgical way. And as we think about the level of activity in the general population and the exposure to certain chemicals, um, all increase our risk. And so when we think about how do we decrease our risk of cancer, we think about things like really are there preventative screenings? Are there self exams? Are there immunizations or vaccinations for hepatitis and other things that increase our risk of having cancer? And can we change our daily activity and the way that we really live our lives to be more healthy and, and combat cancers? Esophageal cancer is the first one that I really wanted to share a little bit with you about. It's three times more common in men than women. Hopefully, the lay public knows very little about it. Hopefully, it hasn't touched you. But it is the eighth most common global cancer. And the outcomes are really related, if you will, to the extent of the disease when it's diagnosed and the existing medical conditions. And the five-year survival, those patients that have esophageal cancer, only about 15% of those patients are alive uh, at five years. And you can see the cartoon there as you move from the left to the, to the right, the white uh, diagram there, first really just involving the lining of the esophagus and then moving towards the right as it gets deeper and deeper across the esophagus and then even uh, spreads elsewhere in the body. The risk factors for esophageal cancer, the first two we can't change, right? As we get older, we're at increased risk for esophageal cancer and men are three times at more risk than women. But some of these we can. Our body habitus, our obesity is a rising incidence in Australia and elsewhere in the world. Smoking certainly increases our risk and, and it also rises with alcohol intake. The symptoms of esophageal cancer are very rare uh, because it really, it becomes quite substantial in the esophagus before it creates the symptoms of having trouble swallowing or pain when swallowing or unanticipated weight loss maybe a hoarse voice or lymph nodes near the top of the collarbones, a dry cough or occasionally coughing up blood or even vomiting blood are really the symptoms. But unfortunately, it has to be quite substantial in the esophagus before these types of symptoms occur. The way it's diagnosed is with a, a camera, a flexible endoscopy that goes down the esophagus and, and takes a look inside. And the image on the far left is that of a esophageal cancer. So a mass that shouldn't be there in the lining of the esophagus can then be biopsied 
and then the images in the middle and the far right there are CT scans. Outlined in red are the areas of the esophagus that are thickened, indicating that there is a cancer there, something that shouldn't be there. But the first step is really the scope to try to understand. And then there are scans called PET scans and endoscopic ultrasounds to look into the esophagus to understand just how deep in the esophagus does this cancer invade and is it elsewhere because this really changes whether we're able to operate on it or not. There are really two different types of esophageal cancer and they're divided kind of into the geography of where they occur. And squamous cell cancers are similar in the way they look to skin cancer almost. And it really occurs in the top portion of the esophagus. And then when we look at the lower portion of the esophagus where the, the food actually goes right before it goes into the stomach, we see that those cells look more glandular. They look almost like intestinal cells many times. And it's linked to some reflux, acid heartburn that we see in some patients where the cells are actually transformed and then they subsequently can become a cancer in many cases. The causes of the cancer I alluded to already a little bit but I think they're kind of specific to where it occurs. Smokeless tobacco and, and uh, smoking cigarettes or cigars both increase the risk of those cancers that occur in the upper portion of the esophagus. Also alcohol use, very hot drinks or a poor diet. And in some cultures, chewing a beetle nut is like chewing tobacco and that also increases the risk. The risk of the distal esophagus is really, it's called adenocarcinoma, is really more about smoking and obesity and that heartburn or reflux. And in particular, the males have the predominance here. And so it's seven to 10 times more common. And that's probably because of the abdominal obesity and the way that men wear the extra weight. And Dr. Brown and their group look at that pretty specifically. But again, reflux is more common there. And we think reflux is really the cause of many of those cancers. So the risk factors and the impact they make are really additive. So if one smokes or one has excessive alcohol, the risk of a cancer in the upper esophagus is probably about five-fold. But if one smokes and has excessive alcohol, the risk increases some 25 to 100-fold. These are modifiable lifestyle choices that we all make and ones that we really are obliged to inform the public of and make certain they understand just the risk of smoking alone really increases this risk. The risk of heartburn and obesity is, is clearly things that we can modify. So I don't take care of esophageal cancer, but I, it has touched me. It was probably the first cancer I was ever exposed to as a young man. Uh, this was my football coach in the United States in Mississippi and um, very healthy guy, not obese, didn't drink, didn't smoke. And um, when my brother came through, we'd never won a state championship and he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And that year as he fought for his life, uh, they charged forward and won the state championship and they made a movie about his life. And, um, and I remember this was one of the very first cancers I really kind of came in contact with. So esophageal cancer doesn't just strike those that we can identify the risk, it strikes others, so we have a long way to go. As we try to understand what the other risk factors might be, there are things like a bacterial infection. So there's a bacterial infection that can occur in the stomach, and it's been linked to some of the gastric cancers and some of the gastric ulcers, the stomach ulcers that we see. But it's interesting because it seems that the infection of that bacteria in the stomach may actually protect the esophagus. So some of the acid reflux we see into the esophagus, the heartburn, if you will, is actually um, somewhat protected um, from occurring if this bacterial infection actually is present. And again, we look at staging, and that cartoon I showed you earlier is on the left here, but you see the one on the right as well. So the cancer starts out very small in the lining of the esophagus, and then it grows deeper into that swallowing tube or the esophagus as we try to understand what operation do we need, or can there be an operation performed. Many patients cannot have an operation performed because it's simply found too late. So in prevention, we think about smoking cessation, we think about alcohol moderation, we think about healthy diet and activity, all the things that our parents told us about eating healthy vegetables and fruits and fiber. And then we also think about those patients that have screening and can they, can they be screened if they have heartburn and should they have a scope done and should this be surveyed very, very closely to try to anticipate finding it very early. The treatment in Australia, and I've traveled a lot, I've been in, in China and India and a lot of other places uh, in Asia, but Australia has really impressed me because they understand and they get the idea of multidisciplinary care. So when you as a patient, if you, ha if you do have an illness that involves cancer, I think in Australia it's the standard of care that whoever you meet has a whole team of people that you may never meet that discuss your case and really think about what are, what are the best options and what's the course of therapy for you. And the multidisciplinary team is standard in Australia and I've been super impressed. It extends to nutritional support as well and it's very stage dependent on what we do next after the diagnosis. But surgery is certainly a vital part of that uh, curative approach. We also think about palliative care. So palliative care is not giving up on patients. It's really focusing on symptoms and trying to help patients live longer with a good quality of life. And really standard of therapy now has involved chemotherapy and radiation as well for esophageal cancer. 
So if it's found very early, many times through that same scope that you saw that we would insert to diagnose it, it can actually be excised, but that's a rare case that it's found that early because so many times it doesn't cause symptoms at, the, at that stage. I will tell you in the United States, it's been very clearly shown in all the three of the cancers we'll talk about briefly tonight, that the volume and the experience of the center matter. And so here at the Alfred and at other centers in Australia, they are doing a lot of that particular cancer case. I think it's one of the most important questions a patient can constantly ask is, how many times do you see this? How often do you take care of this? Because this really translates, I think, into how patients do ultimately. We think about the esophagus as being able to be removed and replaced either by a portion of the stomach or by the intestines. And the surgical approaches to remove the esophagus, if one can have surgery, are really based on either a neck incision, a chest incision, or an abdominal incision, and it's some combination of those. There are also specific chemotherapies that are generally given for patients and radiation. And those are based on big trials that have taken close looks at does this add to the surgery? So it's not that one is mutually exclusive and actually offers the same benefit. It's really synergistically together, chemo, radiation, and surgery are the best chance for patients with this cancer. Unfortunately, as I mentioned to you, many patients can't have surgery, and so we think about what can we do for them. We can give them chemotherapy and radiation. We can even insert a small stent. You can see a diagram here in the cartoon that would hold the esophagus open so that they could get therapy and continue to eat. Sometimes we have to place temporary tubes or even permanent tubes into the stomach to give them nutrition, and we certainly think about palliative care and managing their symptoms. So I think the future directions and our lifestyle modifications of diet and smoking and alcohol, there are things like identifying patients that have reflux and heartburn and intervening by watching them very closely with scopes. And then in all three of these cancers, and in cancer in general, we've now had the whole genome sequence of humans, and we can certainly try to identify genomic variants and subgroups that we can understand then. And I'll show you a little bit about pancreas cancer, how we're using some of the markers of certain cells in the cancer to determine really what therapy we'll be giving patients. The pancreas is, is the second organ I kind of want to draw your attention to. And again, hopefully, you know, you haven't been touched by this directly, but the pancreas is located in the abdomen. It's just behind the stomach. Um, you know, I often see people and they'll say, you operate on the liver and the pancreas. I didn't know you could operate on either one of those. You, you, you can operate on those. Uh, patients don't generally understand that you don't need your pancreas to live. Um, you, the pancreas really serves two purposes. An endocrine function, which secretes insulin and controls your blood sugar, and an exocrine function, which actually helps you digest food with enzymes. So, you know, Banting and Best won a Nobel Prize defining insulin. So you can take insulin if you don't have a pancreas, or if your pancreas isn't working as well, you take insulin. If you don't have a pancreas, you can also take some enzymes when you eat your food to help digest the food. So it's really about trying to find spots in the pancreas that need to be removed early, but it's not that you have to have your pancreas or it can't be operated on. Pancreas cancer is clearly on the rise. The lifetime risk is about 1 in 65, and in males it's higher than females, 1 in 57. Typically it occurs late, again, like esophageal cancer. It's very difficult to find it early, and it's very largely chemotherapy and radiation resistant has to do with the fact that there's not a lot of blood flow into the pancreas. It's very hard to deliver the therapy where it really needs to be from a chemotherapy standpoint. Pancreatic cancer in Australia. When we look at this from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, we see that there's an estimated number of new cases of, of pancreas cancer this year. And you can see that there are more in males than in females. And it represents about 2.5% of all the new cancers diagnosed uh, this year uh, in Australia. It's the most lethal of all the major cancers. And so we have a lot of work to do. When we think about the chances of surviving at five years, it's about 7% of the patients. And so it, it clearly there are a number of patients that are living during a five-year span, but we have tons of work to do as we try to battle this and help patients live even longer. The symptoms of pancreas cancer are upper abdominal pain, maybe some decreased appetite, nausea or vomiting. Sometimes patients become yellow in their eyes or their skin, jaundice is what we call that, uh, weight loss a change in bowel habits, and less commonly they have back pain or an onset of diabetes. The causes we can link to are smoking. As patients get older, they're at increased risk for pancreas cancer. Diabetes increases that risk, and some familial history of pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, or colon cancer. We actually have a hereditary clinic in, in Milwaukee where we screen patients that we think are at increased risk, usually two first-degree relatives that have had uh, one of those cancers. And then pancreatitis also increases that risk. Smoking in Australia is, is still uh, pretty popular when you look at it. 13% of Australians over 14 years of age smoke daily. And if you smoke 10 cigarettes, that doubles the risk of dying. If you smoke 25 a day, that it increases it fourfold. 
and men smoke more often than women, and this is certainly one of the reasons we see it more commonly in men, we think. It is encouraging to see that over the last uh, two decades, we've seen a 10% decrease in Australia of people that smoke. And if you look at the proportion of 18 to 44-year-olds here, you can see even a more dramatic uh, decrease. So I do think the packaging and the messaging is getting out to the public, but we still have a ways to go. We see age-specific across the x-axis here as we go out. We see the increased incidence of pancreas cancer, just as I mentioned to you, as you get older. Unfortunately, those lines show not only the incidence, but also the mortality. And so we recognize that patients that get pancreas cancer often uh, die from their disease. There are some hereditary risks of, of pancreas cancer, the BRCA1 and 2. You may have heard about that. Angelina Jolie was diagnosed with one of these and was on the cover of Time Magazine a couple of years ago. There's also other syndromes with uh, polyps or melanoma in the GI tract that can increase our risk. And again, these are patients that we could perhaps be profiling their families, screening them, and studying their genomics as well to learn more about it. So for example, the BRCA1 and 2 gene the mutation, you can see in the center of the general population. The general population is at risk of breast cancer 12% lifetime. So one in eight women will have breast cancer in their lifetime. But you can see if they have the BRCA1 or 2, their risk is more like 80% or 70% lifetime risk of breast cancer. So you can understand why prophylactic surgery takes place there. But if you look to down the bottom, pancreas cancer occurs in about a half a percent. But again, with the BRCA1 or 2, 3% or up to 7% depending. So we're trying to identify patients we know are at greater risk to screen them very carefully. This is the Australian GI Trials Group that published this last year in August. And they have gotten together and tried to say, how can we do this in a nationwide effort in Australia and try to really categorize this so that we can make meaningful gains for patients. One of the things we really had a hard time with was just categorizing patients or can they have surgery to have it removed? Is it questionable or is it not operable? And so they've recommended those three groups and, and that's, that would be a huge uh, a jump forward, I think. Also, the multidisciplinary care that occurs here and the other centers I've visited doesn't occur everywhere. And they've really said that it has to, it has to. And then the imaging, the CT scans or the MRIs need to be within four weeks. And they really went down very granularly and said, if patients need a blood vessel resected when they have their pancreas cancer, they need to go to a center that does that often. And they need to go for the first operation, not the second operation. Even the way that we report, how, did we get all the way around the cancer, the margins, if you will, of the cancer need to be uniformly reported. And patients that are questionable on whether they can have surgery or not to safely remove it need to get therapy before the operations. And so they really believe, and I do too, and I, and I know the, the physicians here do, that national institutions of, of these kind of things to decrease the variation will improve the outcomes and offer a patients a very reproducible uh, type of um, of operation and outcome. In Milwaukee, we're using uh, endoscopy to go down the swallowing tube, look at the pancreas, and take a small needle biopsy of a spot in the pancreas. And then with that little biopsy, we're looking at a little panel, if you will, of immunohistochemistry to try to determine which chemotherapies patients should get. And then we're giving them chemotherapy before we take them to the operating room uh, for their resection. And we're trying to see if we can give patients that therapy up front and use this profile of their molecular analysis, the, exactly what we see in their specific tumor, to give them a therapy that maybe we wouldn't give to everyone. And, and rather than just say everyone gets this recipe, we say, well, this person has this marker and they need this chemo. And so we're trying to compare the overall survival rates of actually profiling these tumors. And so you can see here that we biopsy these tumors, and this is really probably more for the physicians in the room, but we're looking at things like SPARC and TOPO1, ERCC, and we're literally going down across the bottom of this slide, and you can see that for the physicians, they're getting capecitabine and NAB, or they're getting Fulfury, or they're getting XRT and GEM, or GEM and arena TCAN. You can see a very, very tailored, personalized way to approach this. We've, this is not published data, but it'll be published later this year, I'm sure. 130 patients have been enrolled. 60 of them were resectable and could go right to the operating room, but we chose to give them therapy first. 70 of them were questionable. And you can see that even with giving them that therapy up front, 92% of those that we gave therapy to still wound up in the operating room. They were resectable and they remained resectable. But it's very interesting to see that those that we questioned whether they could go to the operating room, when we gave them therapy, 74% of those patients also went to the operating room. So I do think we're moving the needle. Uh, this is a picture in the bottom right of earlier this week. Um, the Victoria group is looking at all the outcomes and that's really led by Chris Christoffi and Charles Pilgrim. And uh, there'll be a summit later this month to try to say, how are we doing as a state and what can we do better? And what are, what are the opportunities? 
So when we think about providing personalized medicine, like I described to you, taking a biopsy and then tailoring therapy, I think it's incredibly important. When we think about standardizing our outcomes so we can study them in a more meaningful way, it's important. And then we think about risk identification and screening patients for pancreas cancer and encouraging them to modify uh, lifestyle risk. Now the third cancer I want to share with you is that of liver cancer. And uh, I, I operate on this very commonly and I have a lab that's dedicated to this as, as well. It comprises about 80% of the cancers that begin inside the liver. So there are some cancers that begin in the bile ducts or in the gallbladder, but most of them begin within the liver itself. It accounts for 1% of all the deaths globally this year. So it's a huge health problem for us. It's the third most common cancer in the Asia Pacific region. And you can see here, Australia is actually a little lower incidence uh, than the United States, or the United States is a little higher than, um, than the Australia is. But you can see it really affects Asia and Africa, and that's because hepatitis is very rampant there. So the instance is much higher in men than women. Hepatitis B and C are the primary global causes of liver cancer, viral infections that you have that can then damage your liver. When you have a damaged liver, you're at increased risk for liver cancer. It's really two diseases you're fighting then. You're fighting a cirrhosis problem with your liver and you're fighting a liver cancer. And over the last decade, the instance and the mortality of HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer, all the same term, are increasing in Australia. And most of that that people think is one of the main factors is immigration. There's a lot of Asian-born residents that have now immigrated our to Australia, I almost called it our country. So yeah, I feel very at home. Uh, but 30 times more likely to develop HCC. And if we see an Asian uh, immigrant in the United States, we know that the chances of them having hepatitis are one in eight. So it's incredibly high. And this, um, again, breast cancer, we're having a hard time identifying the risk. Esophageal cancer, we're having a hard time identifying the risk. Liver cancer, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, cirrhosis of the liver. And males carry at least a three times risk in Australia with females. This Asia Pacific Clinical Practice Guidelines was just uh, updated. And you can see again, if you see HB, HBV and HCV, Hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Hepatitis B, three to five percent risk per year if you have cirrhosis. Or hepatitis C, two to seven percent per year. So um, I'm a doctor, I'm not a businessman. I'm sure there's a business person in the room that's an accountant or is a banker and they can tell us about compounded interest. You can apply it here, right? If you're at seven percent risk every year of something, it's, you're sitting on a time bomb. So we know that these are the patients that we should be screening because risk factors help us screen patients, they help us prevent cancers, and they help us treat patients earlier if we can identify who's at risk. There's a lot of different ways to stage liver cancer, but I would just say to you that we have to look at how the patient is performing because we know they have damage to their liver independent of their liver cancer, and there's a whole list of ways to try to quantify how are, they, how are they doing from a performance status? And then look at the staging actually of the liver cancer. So it's really two diseases. We know hep B and hep C, those are both viral infections that can cause damage to the liver and we know alcohol causes damage to the liver. So it's very interesting, it's not just a viral infection that causes liver cancer, it's really damage to the liver. There's also other ways that the liver can be damaged. Without alcohol you can have steatohepatitis or a fatty liver and that increases your risk of liver cancer as well. There's exposure to certain chemicals. Diabetes or obesity also increase our risk, as well as hereditary conditions, such as hemochromatosis and iron storage disorder can increase your risk. And there are metabolic diseases. So you can see the cartoon across the bottom there, a healthy liver on the left that then goes to a fatty liver, that it can go to a fibrotic liver, that then eventually can go to a cirrhotic liver. And the goal is to not be in the cirrhosis, and if, they, if someone does have cirrhosis, to be screening them very aggressively so we detect it very early. Because similar to the first two cancers I showed you, you can see these symptoms are pretty general, right? Abdominal pain, nausea, some weight loss, I mean, loss of appetite, you're a little yellow in the eyes. By the time you turn yellow in your eyes, many times your liver is really failing. That's not the goal. The goal is to identify patients at risk, screen them aggressively, and find it much earlier. This is probably the biggest medical advance in the last 20 years. Um, hepatitis C can now be cured. And we've never been able to say that. And uh, the government here in Australia approved the treatment with these direct acting antivirals in March of last year. And they approved everyone to be treated. Now here's the challenge. In the United States, those that are infected, 10% know they're infected. 90% of the people don't know they're infected. And we have a cure. 
So the onus is on us to do things like Dr. Brown's doing tonight and the Department of Surgery are doing to try to raise public awareness. There's a lot of people out there that got hepatitis 20 years ago, they turned yellow jaundice, it resolved, and there was no treatment, and there was no burning platform to say we gotta get you to treatment. But we have a cure for hepatitis now, and in eight to 12 weeks, much more than 90% of patients will be cured, and they can be retreated. But here's the other thing, they can also be reinfected. If there's use of IV drugs or blood transfusion that wasn't screened years ago when that wasn't screened as well, a tattoo, other, other things like that can increase the risk of, of hepatitis. These are the patients that we need to be thinking about. If you, people that have had a blood transfusion, people have turned yellow jaundice, people have a tattoo, people have used IV drugs, all those people could be cured of their hepatitis if we find them. Obesity is another huge problem in Australia. Two in three of adults were overweight or obese 2014 to 15. And oh, you'd say obese, what does that mean? Or overweight, what does that mean? What, you know, it's uh, weight in kilograms over height in meters squared is the way to do it. And that's hard for a US guy to even use the metrics, right? But if I can do it, I'm sure you can do it. Um, but o overweight means greater than 25 generally. 28% uh, of Australian adults were obese. So over 30 BMI uh, in, in, um, in 14 to 50. And that's an increase uh, from 19% in 1995. So this is a huge growing epidemic. And when we think about managing liver cancer, we think about a huge team of people. We think about surgery, medical oncology, palliative care that we talked about, managing symptoms. But we also think about radiation oncology and radiology and pathology. And really the people that treat hepatitis are generally hepatologists or GI doctors, but screening patients and understanding who's at risk so that we can intervene. The liver is a pretty amazing organ and I constantly get asked this so I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. It's the one organ that will grow back. And so uh, we've known that for a long time, right? If anyone knows their Greek mythology, I usually quiz the medical students. If they know too much about this, then I say you need to be studying more, not reading Greek mythology. But, but you, you all remember this is Prometheus. He stole fire and he gave it to man. And for that, he was punished. He was chained to a mountain. And every day an eagle came and pecked his liver out and his liver grew back. So we can remove three quarters of someone's liver, leave only a quarter of their liver behind, and, and they'll be okay if the liver is healthy. And what's amazing is the majority of the growth of it growing back occurs in the first seven to 10 days. So it's a pretty phenomenal organ. We only wish that our heart muscle would grow back or brain tissue after a stroke would grow back, but it's the only organ that does that. So we have a lot of treatment options for liver cancer. We can resect portions of it. We can remove portions of the liver, as I just told you. We can also stick needles in and burn spots and then leave that burned area inside the liver if we find it and it's very small. We can actually transplant the liver. So we can remove the liver. And the reason that's important is because the liver is damaged, it's cirrhotic, it has this irreversible scarring inside of it. And so now we're removing this cirrhotic damaged liver and we're removing the cancer and we're replacing it. And you'd say, how do people do with that? They do incredibly well. At five years, there's probably 75% of those people alive. And then we think about other therapies such as yttrium, which is a glass bead, or chemotherapy to treat liver cancer. We think about radiation, we think about clinical trials, and then we think about combining all those in what I would call multimodal therapy, trying to think about can we burn a spot in the liver, but know that it's cirrhotic and it's damaged and they're gonna need a liver transplant? Are there other things we can do? We also think about palliative care, because when I was in, in Pittsburgh and in Milwaukee, we involved the palliative care physicians, because the second that we diagnose a patient that we can't cure, even if we're trying to make great gains for them, we think about preserving the symptoms and, and the quality of life. This is just a really busy slide to say this. It is complex to take care of liver cancer. The PS you see in the top left corner is the performance status. It's the first thing we think about, or how are patients performing? The blue across it is the stage of the cancer, and the red boxes are the multiple treatment options we have for those patients that I just shared with you a little bit about. But the staging and the treatment of this type of a, of a cancer requires a multidisciplinary team. It's not just a surgical problem or just a medical oncology problem. Unfortunately, only about 30% of the patients that have liver cancer can have that spot removed from their liver. And so 70% were left with thinking about other options. We've got an, a safer operation for esophageal cancer, for pancreas cancer, and for liver cancer. You know, we can help patients live longer with the operation. We can do it very safe, but we still recognize we have a long way to go. When we think about the overall survival in patients with liver cancer, that we remove a portion of their liver, it's probably somewhere between 50 and 70% of those patients are alive if we catch it very early and, and their liver is functioning well. But we also know that it's very common for them to have recurrence of their cancer inside their liver. When we think about who we're gonna to take to the operating room to remove a portion of the liver, we think about how's the patient doing? Do they have other problems and how's their liver work? 
and then we estimate that size because as I told you, you have to leave about a quarter of that liver behind. And so we can actually measure the volume of it to make certain that we're leaving enough. And, and then we have to think about other diseases or other problems that might occur because the liver is essentially a glorified blood filter for the body. And if that blood filter is scarred or damaged, then the blood can't get through it as well. And that causes a lot of other problems as well. We generally look for small tumors that are um, single and they haven't spread beyond the liver. And we know that we've been able to make a safer operation for patients. The mortality, the risk of dying from operations like liver surgery are certainly about a little less than 3% per year, I mean per operation. But 3% is still real to 3% to of patients. And so we still have some ways to go. So we think about things like how is their liver working and how old is the patient, how much of the liver do we need to remove. But it's rare that we have to give blood transfusions now. And we've been able to couple what we do with a lot of uh, interventions by the anesthesiologist, and this is probably more for the physicians in the room, but to say have we improved our surgical techniques of dividing the liver? Do we have techniques to clamp off the blood flow that goes into the liver while we divide it so we don't have as much blood loss? And can we use Band-Aid incisions or keyhole incisions to remove portions of the liver and get patients back to work or back home faster with less pain? And, and the reality of that is yes. We also have ways to improve the outcome by almost tricking the liver, choking off blood supply on one side of the liver so that one side would grow larger, and using intraoperative techniques like ultrasound to also remove the liver. But the bottom portion is the most important one. I think it's really about the experience. In the United States, we've seen up to a 10% mortality in, in low volume centers in the US. So I just told you that the mortality was less than 3% and I wasn't happy with that. You can imagine three times that mortality is not, is not acceptable in centers that don't often do the operations. Transplant is potentially curative, as I mentioned to you. You really ad uh, uh, you're addressing not only the scarring and the damage of the liver, but also the liver cancer. And we use specific criteria to determine if a patient is early enough to have a liver transplant. And that was really pioneered by Tom Starzl uh, in Pittsburgh. But when he was in Denver, he did the first liver transplant. Then he moved to, to Pittsburgh in 1980. He just passed away in, in April at 91 years of age. But his, his protege, Vincent Mazzaferro, established this Milan criteria so that we need to find one single lesion in the liver that's a cancer or up to three there, um, there none of them are larger than three centimeters to be able to transplant patients. And the survival at five years is probably 70 to 75%. So we, we kind of draw this weighing of saying, well, should we take patients that have liver cancer in the operating room and cut out a piece of their liver or should we transplant them? And I would tell you there's no waiting time to, tra to, to cut a piece of the liver out. You don't have to wait for a liver to be available. The five year survival is pretty good, but the chances of it coming back are very real. Liver transplant, you have to wait on the list, and the chances are that you might get to your liver, but you might not. But it addresses two diseases. It addresses your cirrhosis and your cancer. So, we, so this is the kind of deliberations we have in a multidisciplinary kind of team meeting when we get around that table and start talking about who's fit for the, what operation. This, is, I think, this isn't my son, but it could be. I live on Lake Michigan, and he would try this. I can guarantee you, and, uh, and this is kind of what we felt like when we started saying, well, can we do these keyhole Band-Aid incisions and take out pieces of the liver? We know that there's a lot of blood vessels there and it, it could be uh, challenging, but we began to select very specific patients that have very small lesions in very amenable locations in the liver to remove them uh, laparoscopically. And we taught the first laparoscopic liver course in the U.S. Uh, when I was in Pittsburgh. And we know that when we look at the data, we don't have good randomized trials of patients that got an open resection versus got these keyhole incisions to say one is better than the other for liver surgery for this primary liver cancer. But we can equate it to other things that we've done like a colon surgery. And we've tried not to do patients that were, were real difficult. Now, I'll just show you this because you may not have been in the operating room before. And uh, the points are this. There's a lot of people standing around the, hot, the bed here. The patients in the center, you can see the, the front of their abdomen there. The pa no one's looking at the patient, right? We're doing these keyhole Band-Aid incisions. We're all looking at the TV screens, right? Because we have these Band-Aid incisions and we have these long instruments that we've inserted to do the liver operation. It takes a team of people to do something like this and the benefits potentially are patients go home faster and there's less pain after the surgery. We have a lot of instruments now like ultrasound that we use in the operating room. They depict the blood vessels that we're going to cut through so that we can really minimize the blood loss that we, that we have. And if, if the head is to the left and the feet are to the right, and this is the abdomen, this black line used to be the incision we made on everyone that needed a liver operation. Now it's really about making very small Band-Aid incisions in many patients. And, and this equates, it doesn't matter if you have three of these or six of these, you, you go home faster and you feel better. We've also used needles to insert in the liver, as I told you, to destroy certain tumors. 
And these ablations, if you will, or using alternating current to kill a spot in the liver have been very, very good for tumors that are usually about an inch and a half in diameter. And we either do it under ultrasound or, or CT guidance, and patients go home the same day many times. We also know this. Um, about 10 years ago when I was in Pittsburgh, we got the first drug approved ever for liver cancer. FDA had never approved a drug before. We used to tell patients there's no chemotherapy for you. And this drug works in three different pathways on uh, primary liver cancer. Now here's the humbling thing. If they took the drug, they lived almost 11 months. If they didn't take the drug, they lived a little more than, a little less than eight months. It added 11 weeks of life to patients to take the drug. So we were celebrating the idea that the FDA had given us the green light for a drug and it seemed to matter and we knew targeted therapy seemed to matter, but it was far from a home run but it really primed the pump for primary liver cancer. And we've seen tons and tons of drug trials now in the pipeline because of this trial that we participated in. And then we can give chemotherapy directly into the liver. So it doesn't have to go throughout the body. If it's only in the liver, many times we can use this special technique where we go through the groin artery and instill chemotherapy directly into the liver. And so just a couple of examples. You can see the top left here, the, the blue arrow shows a big tumor on the CT scan. This is a CT scan, the things in the back uh, are the, are the uh, kidneys, and this is the liver that you see predominantly in the front. And you can see the blue arrow to the right there shows a much smaller tumor eight months later after they've gotten some chemo directly into their liver, and then they undergo a resection. Uh, that's the kind of response that we want, and that's multimodal therapy. So optimizing liver health means really understanding the risk factors that we can implement and we can intervene for, understanding hepatitis B has a vaccine. I mean, we're vaccinating, but it's going to take us quite some time to see those patients that we vaccinate not getting liver cancer. We're still seeing patients that didn't get vaccinated that got hepatitis. But we now have a cure for hep, for hep C, and there's certainly lifestyle changes like weight loss, alcohol, tobacco as well. Somebody asked me uh, a couple of days ago, he said, do kids ever get liver cancer? And so I thought I'd end with this. Um, the, the answer is yes, and the answer is also, fortunately, rarely. Um, this is a four-year-old girl that had an uncorrectable problem with her bile duct. And she was in Denver, Colorado when Dr. Stargell was there before he came to Pittsburgh. And in 1970, uh, she had a liver transplant. She's the longest living uh, liver transplant recipient. Here she is in elementary school, in high school. This is Tom Starzl who did her liver transplant, seeing her in high school. And then here she is on the far right with her husband visiting Pittsburgh. And uh, I don't know if any, any of you have ever been to Pittsburgh. Um, I'd love to buy you a beer if you have. Um, but it's... Uh, in front of Roberto Clemente. Roberto Clemente is a very famous baseball player. and He's called the Great One, and we would say she's the Great One. She's the longest living uh, liver uh, transplant survivor at, at four years of age getting her liver. So the burden of liver cancer is increasing. The management really requires a multidisciplinary team. The treatment selection really depends on the tumor characteristics and the underlying liver and the damage to the liver. And surveillance, we can identify patients that are at risk for liver cancer better than almost any other cancer out there. Even though it's a lethal cancer, we can, we can certainly intervene. So in conclusion, uh, esophageal, pancreas, and liver cancer are major health challenges. And, and they're not forgotten. They're just not, and they're not mentioned as much, but they're not forgotten. The risk factors clearly exist, and they, they may be amenable uh, to intervention. And the efforts uh, to make successful and safer surgery have clearly occurred but we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us. So healthcare has to push forward for the patient of tomorrow. So we have to think about the arena of drug development, of personalized medicine, and regionalization of care. So I appreciate your uh, attention. This is my home in Milwaukee, and thank you so much for the opportunity.